today, we've just seen the animated Bible reading from Revelation 12. It's pretty, pretty crazy stuff, isn't it? It's fascinating when you see it actually visually presented and you realise just how wild and crazy some of these images are uh, in, in the book of Revelation. You just remember it's a special language, it's a code language to enable uh, the, the, the leaders of the church to get their message out to their flocks in a way that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't arouse any sub suspicions uh, with the Roman uh, law enforcers <laughs> of, the, of the day. So we're looking at uh, chapter 12 and the three characters, the woman, the child and the dragon. So as usual with Revelation, things are rarely what they seem when you read it at first. All I can do in this very brief look at a very complex passage is offer you some different ways of looking at Scripture. Now I'm going to tell you stuff, just receive it, hold it at arm's length and just look at it and think, oh yeah, fair enough, yeah, I can see that, or no. Nah. Don't think I'm with you on this one, Peter. Okay, you know what I mean? There are so many different ways of interpreting this stuff that no one knows whether they're right or wrong. All you can do is offer um, your prayerful best guess as to what it all means. So, yeah, in Revelation, everything is contested. Everything. And there's little general agreement. So hopefully um, some of you will find this uh, helpful. Yes. I believe this is what God wants us to bring to you this morning. We're going to look at our passage from a cosmic or celestial point of view. And then we're going to have a look at the scripture to support it using the same method that we've been using from week one. If we allow the Bible to speak for itself. We allow the Bible to interpret the Bible, okay? which I think is always the safest. So we start off with Romans chap uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, then being with child, she cried out in labour and in pain to give birth. Okay, so this one's a bit special. Right, this one came into global prominence in the months leading up to the 23rd of September 2017. You might recognise that the language in these first two verses is to do with the stars in the heavens. And the first of our reads on Revelation 12 then is based on actual observable astronomy. Astronomy is the ancient science and the ancient people, peoples not having any form of light pollution in the night sky as well as not spending their nights watching TV became very, very good at tracking the stars and the planets across the night sky. They recognised constellations and gave them names. This gave rise to another form of star watching called astrology. Astrology is another form of divination and is treated by the scriptures as witchcraft. Okay? So we've got two things. Astronomy, observable science. Astrology, divination. Needless to say, back in the day, the boundaries between these two practices became blurred. Right? Uh, as, as, as you see in this reading today, it's, um, it, it's somewhat blurred. But nevertheless, um, we recognise 12 constellations of stars common to both fields and they are the 12 signs of the zodiac. And they're up there, they're up there every night. Right? You can see them. Uh, both astrology and astronomy recognise the same constellations. Astronomy makes observations directly from the movement of the stars and the planets across the sky. And astrology 
ascribe some kind of influence that the star signs have over individuals based on the date of their birth. As I said, it's a form of divination. So astronomy good, astrology bad. But we do need to understand something, that God put placed the stars there as signs for us. Right in the very first chapter of Genesis, starting from verse 14 and the creation, then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So you're with me, with me so far? Okay. So Revelation 12 verses 1 and 2 and following describe an astronom astronomical phenomena, a very real one and a very rare one. It has only occurred twice in recorded history. The first one was on September the 11th, okay, 9-11. That's a creepy number, isn't it? The first one was on September the 11th, 3 BC, a date that conforms very closely with the possible birth of Jesus. And I suggest that this is the event described in Revelation 12. There has long been a school of thought that assumes that everything about Re Revelation is about events that have not yet happened. And there are also those who believe that everything in Revelation has already happened, except the second coming of Jesus. And this apocalyptic description of an astronomical event in Revelation 12, as for the futurists believing that the event has not yet happened, their eyes have been on the heavens looking for signs for the end of the world, right? And they've always taken this passage as, uh, as, as being a sign. When they see this sign in the sky, that's the start of the Great Tribulation. Okay, the church is going to be raptured and, uh, and the Great Tribulation will hit the earth. Um, I don't happen to hold to that stuff, as I've already explained before. So, the second event led up to uh, when this uh, astronomical event occurred was on the 23rd of September, 2017. Let's have a look at it. I'll put a picture up on the screen that explains it. Okay, I, uh, I hope you can see. But if you have a look at uh, any, any star app on your phone or on your computer, you'll see that there's a line across the sky that all the planets move on. It's like a straight line. When you see them, they come up that line, across the sky and down that line. It's called the ecliptic. Right? If you imagine the sun in the middle and, and everything, all the planets on a disk going round, it's a straight line around the sun, that's called the ecliptic. And along the ecliptic, where the planets move, are the 12 constellations uh, in a circle. Right? And on 23rd of September 2017 and the 11th of September 3 BC, this happened. Okay, so you've got Virgo there, and you've got Leo up above, right? Out of screen, down to the uh, upper side of the ecliptic, is uh, the, the fiery red dragon, which is a combination in ancient times. They didn't have Scorpio and Libra. They just put the two together and made a dragon. And on the uh, lower side is the other possible alternative to the dragon, which is the uh, hydra, the serpent. Okay, so that's a picture of the sky. And let me just uh, explain it to you bit by bit the way it works out. So if we have a look at this, I'll get 
my little pointer out to see if it's got any battery. Okay, so here's the here's Virgo, the only female constellation. All right. In astronomical terms, she's clothed by the sun, which means the sun is touching her, and the moon is at her feet down here. Right. That's an event that occurs and it only lasts 80 minutes. Okay? Only lasts 80 minutes when you get the sun clothing Virgo with the moon at her feet. Above her head is the constellation Leo. What do you think would be the spiritual significance of Leo? Leo is a Lion. What is the lion and the symbol of in Scripture? The lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion is the symbol of the tribe of Judah. Now, in Leo, there are nine stars, right? And added to Venus, Mars, and Mercury in a straight line, they form the crown of 12 stars around the head of Virgo. All right? So that's what we have there so far. Leading up to this formation, the king star Jupiter, sorry, the king planet Jupiter and the king star Regulus, so you've got two, two royal indications in the sky, Jupiter, the king star, the ancients call it, the, sorry, the king planet. Jupiter is the biggest. And Regulus, the really bright uh, star in the sky, was the king's star. These two moved into conjunction and became a very bright star. And what this meant was that you have a very bright star in the constellation of Leo, the tribe of Judy, the, the conjunction means the birth of a king. In astronomical terms, this was how the ancients saw it. This is what drew the wise men from the east. They saw a conjunction of the two kings coming together to signify a royal birth of the house of Judah. So, there we have this situation where you've got the woman crowned with the tribe of Judah. Remember, both Mary and Joseph were lineal descendants of David, of the house of Judah. And everything is now in place. Now, as this all moves into place, as the moon moves towards her feet and as the sun comes down to clothe her, Jupiter, right wrong button, Jupiter moves into the belly of Virgo. The king star moves into the belly, the womb of Virgo. All of the signs that we see in these first two verses of Revelation 12 had to take place in a very brief window. 11th of September 3 BC, the probable birthday of Jesus, it was also the first day of the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, in Jewish calendar Tishri 1. The Feast of Trumpets heralding the birth of a king. This is a true astronomical event. It happened. It happened on that day. The stars speak. Sorry? The stars speak. Well, I don't know that the stars speak, but the signs are there in the sky for anyone who's willing to, well, who's willing to look. For those uh, 
uh, I've, I've had a look at some astronomical software, you can actually see exactly those images there. It's, it's just common knowledge. Right? It's available to anyone with a, a phone and a, and, a, and a computer. But for those futurists who thought that this repetition of the sign on the 27th of September 2017 would bring about the end of the world, true to their form, they're 100% wrong. It hasn't happened. So, with all that in mind, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? That sign in the sky. Let's look at the scriptures. So once again, we have a big question of identity. And I think you might be a little bit surprised at some of the answers to this question because things aren't always what they seem in Revelation, are they? Okay, so let's just look at the passage itself now. You can see here there are three different characters and they're each doing something a little bit different. We know that the woman during the first few verses is identified by the moon and the sun and the 12 star crown on her head. A few verses down we saw that there's a red dragon and this red dragon takes a third of the stars of heaven with him and he's cast to the earth. And lastly we see the child who the woman gives birth to and that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now all of these verses give us clues as to the identity of these people. So we're going to start with the easy one. The dragon. Now if you can remember from your reading, you might remember that John actually told us who the dragon is. So we don't have to do any fanciful interpretation here. There's no need for guessing. So from verse, 12, verse 9 of chapter 12, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of all, old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast with him. So we know then that the dragon is a metaphor for Satan or the devil himself. It goes on to tell us that when Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he took his angels with him. In heaven, Lucifer was an angel. Uh, you read this, I think it's Isaiah, how he was cast out of heaven. Uh, o Lucifer, O day star, son of the morning, you were the most glorious of all the anointed cherubs until iniquity was found in you. Right? You had to, he had to be cast out. He thought he would take the glory of the worship for himself rather than giving it on to God. So the devil was cast out of heaven and he took his a third of his angels with him. So he's the fiery red dragon is the devil himself. Let's go to the next one, the child. Oh, there we go. Woman, pregnant, moon at her feet, stars on her head, red dragon. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. I suspect we all know who this child is, but we need to check with, what, with what Revelation says about the one who would rule all nations with a rod of iron. We have to turn to Revelation chapter 19, which is one of the most amazing and terrifying passages in the whole Bible because all history is climaxing as Jesus Christ returns and he's not coming as a baby. He's not coming as a broken man on a cross. He's coming as a warrior to judge the nations for what they've done. So we're going to have a sneak preview of Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his heads were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress with the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? So verse 15 tells us that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So the same allusion to the rod of iron is back again in Revelation 2. Right? So right at the beginning of Revelation, we read in Revelation... How, whoa, how's that? That's a beauty in it. Everyone behind him dressed in white. Oh, I like that one. He's got the scepter, the iron scepter that he's holding up there. The symbol of his kingship. I think that's a really cool image. Revelation 2.27 says, He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed, dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. That's actually a quote from Psalms. That's Psalm 2 verse 9 in the Old Testament. So we now have multiple verses actually telling us who the child is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We don't have to guess. There's no wild speculation. Scripture has told us exactly who it is. Now for the biggest question of the message. And I don't pretend to have an answer. The answer, the, the, the points that I'm going to make with you are just a combination of various opinions. And trust me, everyone that's got a Bible's got an opinion. <laughs> and the more educated they are, the more opinions they have. Right? <laughs> there are people making very good income <clears throat> preaching these, uh, these passages. Now, the woman is slightly more difficult to figure out than the dragon. Let's put him back there. Some have claimed she is Israel. Some the church. Remember we're in Revelation now. Right? We're not in a gospel. This is apocalyptic. Everything means something. So some claim that she's Israel. Some claim that she's the church. That's probably the strongest one. And some think it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's the Catholic position. Okay, so, you know, half the world's believers are Catholic and that's what they believe, that the woman is Mary. I don't have to be rocket science scientists to figure out where they got that idea from. But maybe she's symbolic of something else and we'll have a look at the something else. So what I'm going to share with you is just another possibility. It has no more validity than any of the others. They've all got weak points, they've all got strong points. We won't know until it happens. Those that think it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, and in, 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 along with the idea of Mary, you always have that think back to Eve in the garden when they were cast out of the garden. And the very first prophetic scripture in the entire Bible it was in Genesis 3.15 where God told Eve, you know, in pain you'll bear children but she, he, he said um, you know, your seed you know, he shall bruise, talking to the devil uh, you shall bruise his heel is he is heel but he shall crush your head, right, the seed your seed will crush his head, so we have what's called the seed of the woman uh, prophecy that at some point 
the, the, a descendant of Eve would be the one who defeats Satan, the seed of the woman. So whenever you look at Mary delivering Jesus, there's always that hark back to the seed of the woman prophecy, a fulfilment of that first prophecy. Are you with me? So we're going to try and use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Many believe the church is the bride of Christ, so the church fits this aspect of the symbolism pretty well. You know, is, the, is, is, is the woman the church? Could be. Mary was also certainly a woman and she fits that, that aspect. As we've already discussed, she's a very visible and obvious um, candidate for the, the world's Catholics. And in many places, God speaks of Israel as his wife. And in many others, he calls her daughter of Jerusalem. So Israel fits as well. The idea of the woman fits all three of those possibilities. So we have a look at the symbolism of the sun, moon and stars. And these, these concepts are taken right out of Genesis. Joseph was given several dreams, and one of them included sun, moon, and stars. Right? Then he dreamed another, still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bound down to me, me being the twelfth star. So you have twelve stars and the sun and the moon. So he told his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? In this passage, Joseph identifies the stars as the tribe, tribes of Israel, his, his eleven brothers and he is the twelfth. The sun and the moon are his parents. As we have seen, many of John's visions relate back to the Old Testament where they're identified. So this is a very plausible match. The woman is associated with Israel, even genetic Israel, because of the tribes. On this there is little doubt, but the woman is only decorated with those symbols. They aren't the woman itself. The symbols aren't the woman. She's decorated with those symbols. Can the woman be married? Well, if the male child is Jesus, she was the individual woman who gave birth to him. So in a way, yes. But in the general context, or the greater context, no. Because the woman flees into the wilderness. So that can't be the physical Mary. Now Mary and Joseph did flee to Egypt when Herod wanted to kill Jesus, didn't they? But what this, what, what this idea is trying to bring up is the idea of the people of Israel being brought out of Jesus, out, being delivered through the Red Sea from the hand of Pharaoh and being cast into the wilderness. Right? So it's an exodus image. So, can she be the church? The church is already identified later in Revelation 12 as the other children of the woman who hold the testimony of Jesus. So none of the traditional guesses of who the woman is fit perfectly. We need to find something else. Another scriptural reference, the book of Galatians, however, does identify, it gives us a different idea. This one is right out of left field for who the woman is, the mother of us all, the mother who bore the other children of the woman. She is the new Jerusalem. Galatians says, but the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. If you look at Jewish artwork back in the day, 
when you see them do a picture of Jerusalem, you see Jerusalem on the ground, and always up in the air just above, that is the new Jerusalem. Right? There's Jerusalem on the, the earth, and then there's the new Jerusalem. To remember the hope of Revelation is that the new Jerusalem will come down. Needless to say, this is just a whole lot of crazy ideas. It gives you an idea of how people with too much time <laughs> and great imagination can spend working through the issues in the book of Revelation. So where does that leave us? Well, firstly, the passage covers a literal cosmic picture of the gospel story. For the movement of the stars and the planets all being ordered by God to the incredible precision of the birth of Jesus. Precise in the movement of the stars and the planets that advertise the event to anyone skilled enough to read the signs. We know that there were, weren't there? There was wise men. They read the signs. They knew exactly what had happened. Precise in its place in the scriptures. So much so that the scholars in Herod's court were able to advise him of the event when he asked them. You know, what's going on here? Why wasn't I told? Fortunately, they were a little late in their advice to the king and the holy family was safely in Egypt when Herod went on his murderous rampage against the children in Bethlehem. The book of Revelation helps us by preparing us for hardship. Billy Graham notes that his wife grew up in a missionary family in China and saw how God prepared his church there during times of trouble to withstand the even greater troubled times ahead. He notes that the hardships actually have strengthened the church and that God's warnings provided help. Okay, so that's what this book is for. This book is to provide us with the knowledge that bad things are going to happen but not to be afraid, not to be frightened, but to keep up our witness because those last days are going to be the most glorious days of the church. In power, witnessing, miracles, signs and wonders, it'll be a glorious church on the earth in those days like we've never seen it. By portraying the time between Jesus' comings as a great tribulation, like the one that Daniel spoke about, Revelation reminds us that Jesus' followers share his cross. You know, if anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and follow me. That's not an indication of an invitation to a party. That's an invitation to a funeral. You're right. Yeah. Can I stay? Sufferings belong to us in this world, but our Lord Jesus is victorious anyway, amen? All right, John 33, the very last promise Jesus made before he went to the cross. These things I have spoken to you, that in, may, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And the uh, Amplified Version adds the phrase, and I have robbed it of power to harm you. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks, Dave.